see I have the wrong microphone <coughs> okay hello everyone uh, welcome to pony racing this is the fifth episode um, this is a, a competition where four participants try to solve the same ponable challenge uh, at the same time and uh, my co-host Bob and I will be providing uh, commentary and analysis uh, while they are uh, trying to solve the challenge and um, yeah we'll see who, who managed to solve, solve it uh, the first. So today's uh, lineup, uh, Bob uh, could you do uh, maybe an introduction of uh, who is participating today? Yeah sure, so I'll start on top left we have obviously someone who needs no introduction, Mermis uh, famous on YouTube for his own stream and uh, holds the privilege of being the first winner of a pony race and the first returnee. So then we move on to Neo Neo, aka Robert Xiao, who is, we're very lucky to have him from PPP, obviously one of the best teams to ever do it. Um, so I think that speaks for itself, really. Then we have Kid of Ukraine, aka Henry Wang. Um, he's coming from DCUA, which is another one of those top teams that we all know of. And then the final challenger is uh, Otazi, or Otazi, not really sure on that one. Uh, he's coming from, uh, what, University of Lin Shopping team, who has the privilege of beating Zeta 2 at SecFest CTF, so it'd be interesting to see what he does. Okay, I'm just that's really nice. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have all the participants here ready. Mermus, Neo, yeah, hi, hey. yes, yeah. great. Odyssey, Ukraine, everyone's here yep. ready. Great. Uh, I sent you a link uh, here on the on the TeamSpeak for the um. The challenge archive downloaded but don't unpack it i will also send the same link in the stream chat for everyone uh, um, watching if you want to like play along uh, okay so uh, uh, there's some comments about the sound volume i will adjust my volume a little bit uh, before we continue let's make sure that you can hear me loud and clear <coughs> Uh, okay. Are you not getting video? Sir, what? Are you not getting video for me? No, no, I'm, get, I'm getting, or maybe not. It's not, uh, not moving. Uh, so let's yeah. make it check here. Maybe we can just restart stream. Uh, okay. So to the watchers, how is the how is the volume right now? Is this is this better? Uh, and meanwhile, make, wow. we ma let's make sure that everyone's stream is working fine. Uh, there is a Rick roll going on on the Murmur's stream, so that's working. Okay, I good. see Neos is moving and that's blinking and uh, and only Otisi. Do you have? Are you? Let's see. Should be coming up something. Uh, yes, it seems a bit frozen, but. Okay, um, great. So has everyone uh, downloaded the, um, the challenge and are you all ready? It's downloaded. Yes. Good, look good to me. Okay, Neil. Yeah. Great. So then, uh, we will be I, me and Bob will be moving over to the other channel so that you can't uh, hear us and uh, I will do uh, a countdown and then we start so let's just make sure everything is properly set up okay cool uh, let's move over user here. was moved out of your channel channel switched okay so um, all the participants we are going to start now in five Four, three, two, one, go. Good luck. Okay, Bob. So what are we dealing with here uh, today? All right. We have a 64-bit binary 
with uh, all the protections except for Pi, so that's NX, Railroad, all of that, um, and a stack canary. Uh, and then the, the vulnerability is really easy to find. It's right at the top. It's a stack-based buffer overflow. There's no secrets there. Um, so the only thing that's slightly different to how these sorts of things might usually play out is that all communication in the binary is through uh, the F family of functions, the ones that use file pointers, you know, so F prints F, F writes, stuff like that. Um, and so the challenge is to be able to do that usual leak, read a second input thing, or, you know, hijack some uh, IO jumps, uh, but purely through uh, this tiny little binary. And then the purpose of the binary, obviously, is just to uh, uh, it, it print some stats about files on the system. Great. So let's do a round and, and, and check uh, how they are starting out. So first we have uh, Mermus. He is just uh, connecting. To, he's run, just running the challenge. Right. What it's doing. It looks like he's going to be using Ghidra, which I like. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I think, uh, I is it the first time we actually have someone use... Uh, no, we had uh, Zap from RPI Sec. He used it for oh the yeah, first time. Oh, yeah, true, true. So, checking in on uh, Neo. Um, also using Hydra. So... Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so he has opened up the binary and started, uh, started looking at the code. Um, which and it, and as usual, this is not really a bi very big program, right? It's uh... oh yeah, it's tiny. There's three functions: so main and two other functions, and then normal GCC compiled. So the only gadgets available would be the normal universal GCC gadgets. It's very tiny. Will take no time to reverse at all. Great. So um, yeah, Kid of Ukraine are uh, sticking with the um, battle-tested uh, Ida. He's probably more familiar with them. Uh, also, nice custom color scheme. Uh, also, started looking at the uh, code here, um, just exploring, see what's going on. Uh, nothing, nothing special. Well, it looks like he's focused on the area where the buffer overflow is, and he's checking the data section because the byte gets written to the data section. So he's definitely onto the bug already. Great. Uh, okay, checking in with. Uh, OTC, um, also using IDA, so we have two Ghidra to, to IDA. Um, no binary ninja, no isn't binary that a shame? No binary this time. Um, it's, uh, yeah, checking, uh, just looking at the uh, security mechanisms of the um, challenge. Yep, yep, good first step, obviously. Mm, look at that color scheme, that's the, that's the one I like. I don't like, uh, you seem to like the dark colors, don't you? Well, I mean, I used to just the, the stock one, uh, which I, I like, but I, I just like to point out when people have taken their time to, to you know, come up with some con something custom. I'm not, uh, not specifically endorsing the colors themselves, but, you know. Fair enough. It's, it's kind of stressful to commit to actually changing the color scheme. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I've got problems. Yeah. I uh, have some people telling me that there is some issues with my sound uh, but I'm trying to fix it as we go along so please uh, uh, I will try to uh, adjust it as we go so please provide some feedback in the chat uh, if you think it's better um, or whatnot but uh, yeah I'll, I'll try to sort it out I recently changed my uh, motherboard so that might uh, have cost my some of my settings to uh, not apply anymore uh, anyway, let's... Someone's asking how they can learn this, and I think that's an important question to touch on. Uh, right now, the barrier to learn this stuff is the lowest it's ever been in history. So you have free tools that are world-class, like Ghidra, for example, all the debuggers, everything else. Uh, so I think your best chance is just to play CTFs and war games, and that will give you a good grounding. And then you can just learn by watching world-class pornographers like these guys and uh and then just you know keep challenging yourself yeah i mean that's that's uh, so true uh there are multiple of good 
websites with pointable challenges uh, like uh, I mean old school ones like over the wire and like you have right. KR which is a I mean personal favorite um, absolutely and then pointable.tw the open to all guys have pointable.xyz you have root me which starts from really really beginner to about like sort of medium or upper medium uh, there's a lot of choices. I think my favorite would be w3chels.com, which is from the Zero Day Sobers guys. It's pretty cool. Yeah, super nice. Let's see if I can adjust my microphone volume a little bit here. Um, okay, so um, if we take a look at the players again, has anyone started with some active? Oh, if we look at Neo here. Um, he started doing a little bit of um, like manual fussing, so to say, uh, just uh, dumping in some uh, long strings in there. Um, yeah, um, which is great. But th okay, so if you do that with this particular binary, if if you recall episode one, we had a case where the buffer ran into the pointer that we were writing to, and then you could jump backwards. Yeah. This case is kind of like that, except you could overwrite the least significant byte of the index that we're writing into for the buffer. So if you provide the wrong input, it doesn't matter how long it is, then you're going to skip anything that's going to make it crash, and you'll just keep writing all the way on. So it really pays to try and understand the code a little better. Yep. But it looks like he's definitely, I mean, he's populating gadgets in his exploit. He's got, you know, all the crud down. Yeah, and again, as we've sp spoken about on these episodes, uh, is, you know, start early uh, with uh, writing your your uh, exploit script to uh, you know minimize the amount of uh, manual labor that you have to do. All right, right absolutely. That's been a winning strategy the whole time for sure. Yeah, like with Jinmo and all that. We're checking with uh, Mermis here. He's uh, he's running this in the in the debugger. Um, Maybe he's, I I didn't quite catch what like what he was inputting and so on, but uh, yeah, some 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 dynamic analysis going on there. Uh, yeah, that's probably the right way to to be doing it right now. Yeah, I see some over at uh, let's see, down with here, Kid of Ukraine also dumping in some uh, long strings, specifically a one k. A chunk of A's, uh, trying to see what what happens with them. All right, so the buffer size is a thousand and twenty-four bytes. Yeah. So it seems like he's onto that, and then he sees that there's something after, and he's trying to you know figure out what what's the ideal value he can put after, and that's the the idea here is that he will skip rather than leak the stack canary, which is obviously one way that you do these things he's going to skip over it. So the buffer will run down in contiguous memory and then just pop over it and then you can control uh, the saved base pointer and return address. Yeah, and as we also have uh, mentioned previously, we have uh, you know, a, a split between uh, different uh, debugger extensions here. So Ukraine uh, is using uh, Jeff, um, which yep. is... I guess like the second or third most popular uh, choice after Pwn Debug and PETA. I mean, th those are the the three. Some Honestly, I think PETA's fallen off. Yep. It's, it used to hold the crown not too long ago, but I think it's it, the order goes, for me at least, Pwn Debug is number one, yep. and then there's Gef right after it. And the thing is, is that Gef has some really cool tools when it comes to poning. Um I don't know that any of them are going to help here, but if you're used to it, it's just as good as as Pwn Debug for sure. Yeah. No, I think it's it's mostly a lot of uh, you know uh, old timers who might not have bothered to move over from uh, Peta to uh, Pwn Debug. But uh, if you were starting out now, I would say Pwn Debug would be like the go-to choice. Yeah. Besides all the toys, the big distinction is the fact that Pwn Debug and Gev will run on other architectures, whereas Peter won't. Uh, that's that's also good. Uh, we see here Mermus also starting out some uh, uh, writing some actual script. Let's see if he has any commentary going on. Uh, I think. Yeah, he he knows exactly what he's doing. You can see there. You see that eighteen hex. 
that is the value that he'll use to Seriously, skip over the stack canary. He's already onto it. It's good to know. Um, so now he's SSHing to some server for some reason. Come on. You're not going to work right now. Well, we'll leave him with his uh, infrastructure uh, issues and move over to uh, OTC, who is using Pwn Debug. Um, also started out uh, writing a small uh, script here. Looks like he's uh, sending in that uh, uh, 1K uh, of A. He had a he started out with what looked like the, uh, a null byte in the beginning there. Uh, is there any? Yeah. Yeah, so he just wants it to not register as a valid file. He doesn't want it because if you give it uh, a valid path name to a file, then it's going to go do all this other stuff, you know, get some stats about the file or folder or whatever. Yeah. So he's just trying to keep it as simple as possible and just reach that failure condition where he basically gets an error that says that's not a file. Okay, so there is a, there is a point in, in stuffing that null byte in there. Yeah, absolutely. And you see he's using... Uh, oh. Oh, I thought that was Tmux. No, so he's splitting the screen just with the windows. That's, that's nice. I yeah. like that. And I should mention that his teammate, um, Ricky, you know, Ricky Zhu from PPP, is the guy who won that 2015 DEF CON CTF Live. That was the, basically the inspiration for this, wasn't it? Yeah, but now you're talking about Neo, right? Yeah. Um, so, if, speaking of, so well, let's we'll switch over to him and what is he doing? Uh, some static analysis written a little bit more. Oh, there's some addresses in there, some gadgets, and uh, um, I didn't quite see the actual like overwrite in, in, in there, uh, but I didn't quite catch it. So, um, uh. a bit I. Not quite following what he's doing at the moment. Uh, he's using PDA, by the way, you can see here. So, uh, speaking of yeah. uh, old timers. Wow. Uh, well, if it ain't broke. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, there, there you have those uh, those 1K of Ace and uh, the Hex 18 as well, which we saw in uh, Murmur's exploit as well. So, here's what he's doing is he's going to try pop RSI off the stack point it to the global offset table, which is in read-only memory. So he's trying to get that leak. Yeah. But he has to be able to... So here's the issue, right? Is that when you use those F family of functions, you need uh, a valid file pointer. You can't just pass a, a zero or one or a two or whatever um, as, you know, the file descriptor. So in this case, he has to leak that somehow or obtain it, dereference it from the data section in order to use it. Except there are two printfs, f printf statements in the binary, and he could use some stuff there, but then he has the problem of trying to get around the stack canary, which he still doesn't know. So it's a little bit trickier than it seems. The buffer overflow is easy, but uh, there's definitely some tricks that you can use to make this doable. Yeah. So uh, all in all, we have seen that at least uh, Mermus and Neo are on to that. Um, haven't quite seen the same progress exactly yet from Arcania and OTC, uh, but they still, I mean, seems like all of them has, they have, a, I mean, they found the overflow. They're just trying to figure out now what to do with it. So. So w when they put in that hex 18 that both Mermus and uh, uh, Neo are doing, uh, where does that uh, land them? Uh, All right, so you have the buffer and yep. then, you know, the, the I, like an integer called I, yeah. right after the buffer. Yeah. And so the characters are read in to buffer and then, you know, square bracket I at each turn. So by the time they get 1,024 bytes in, which is 400 in hex, Obviously, 400 in hex means that the lower bytes are zero, 00. Yeah. So they're l overwriting that zero, 00, which makes it 418, which skips them ahead, skipping over that stack canary, skipping over uh, the base pointer, and allowing them to control the return address that's sitting on the stack. So it's just 
running down, skipping, and then they can carry on writing a rock chain that way. Yeah. It's... Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, th does to me. I hope uh, hope the uh, our uh, viewers are following uh, as well, and uh, we should have some, we should have had some like nice like graphics to to uh, you know just show on the screen to illustrate these things. But I hope it's 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 clear enough, and otherwise I hope it will be throughout uh, this uh, run. So uh, let's switch back to Mermus. He is now googling for uh, some uh, rob. So he's trying to get uh, some ROP gadget finding tool. He's uh, opting for ROPper. Um, Interesting. So So I wonder if he thinks that I've done something tricky again to hide gadgets. Yeah, because that was in one of the uh, earlier episodes, right? When you uh, yeah. when you hid the very crucial ROP gadget in the build ID of the binary. Right, right. And only a few tools ended up finding it. But in this instance, that's sort of a waste of time. Even just normal Rob gadget will find it. It's just the normal universal gadgets that we all know and love. Yeah. So basically, you get to control RSI, RDI. Uh, you can't usually get RCX, RDX, unless you use that special universal gadget chain thing with uh, CSU in it. So it's it's just normal. Is this what I want? Yeah, so None of that's the problem. The problem is they need to either leak the okay. stack canary or they need to leak the something from libc in order to forge or uh or at least uh predict where the file points are for standard out's going to be yeah so we let's uh let's leave murmurs to his uh pip problems uh, again so uh, he seems to have some infrastructure problems today and look at uh neo again um who is still yeah, he's looking at these uh, this F open code and uh, yeah, smart move. <clears throat> if he restarted the binary, he could use that. So that F open, basically, the binary works like if you provide an argument when you start it up, um, it will use that as a file name, and then the output will go to that file rather than just normal standard out. Um, it's just there so that I have a reason to stick standard out on the stack, to be honest. But you then, as I was playing around with it later, I found some methods that I could use with F open, but they took way longer than the normal method, the intended method. Yeah, and uh, let's let's come back to this uh, to that thing because uh, um, I think this is one of the first time where we know from the start that there are like multiple. Uh, ways to solve this, but uh, let's come back come back to that uh, in a second. Uh, let's check in with uh, Arcania here uh, again, and uh, what? So he is now looking at the uh, the BSS. Uh, I guess trying to see if there is, you know, uh, what at what offset it is, um, and uh, that would be relevant then, right, to leak. Uh, um, no, not in this instance. Well, maybe, maybe. So you have standard out like a file pointer, not the file descriptor. Yep. So a libc wrapped file pointer for standard out, standard in, and standard error sitting there. And then you have this um, an index, a byte, and then the stat structure that is read to get the information about files for the binary. So that's just some junk that's sitting there. Okay. But it's worth looking at for sure. And maybe they can figure out something with the file pointers that are sitting there. But what they're probably going to want to leak would be the standard, you know, global offset table. And that's sitting just below the data section in read only memory since it's full railroad. Yeah. Yeah, so we, I, I think we didn't quite uh, touch on those things. So what we, we say was uh, it's like has all the you know full security protections except that it's not the pi binary right yeah i didn't want to be a pain in the ass that one. <laughs> yeah um it's great so let's check in with uh, uh otc uh doing some debugging uh and trying to see uh no his exploit is 
not on screen so it's a little bit difficult to see exactly uh what he's doing still dumping in some uh you know some a's and some b's uh, i guess to see where where things uh end up uh looking a little bit using this uh, vm map to see where the allocations uh are done and yeah i imagine he's also stepping through just to sort of map it out in his mind what yep. he can take advantage of and what might be a problem down the line yeah so yeah so what let's check back with neo uh he is again looking at this uh this f right uh code and then just exploring the binary checking checking all these uh um, different library function that's being used uh yeah, it would so be cool here if we can see his exploit right so well i could tell you exactly what he's doing he's looking for a way to get that leak he's just realized that he needs to be able to predict the file points of a standard out in order to get a leak yeah so he, he wants to call f writes with some memory location uh so he can dump it but in order to do that he needs to be able to know what is the standard out file pointer so that's the game that's the challenge right here it's not really about the buffer overflow it's about figuring that part out yeah because it happens you know in real life uh sometimes you don't get nice clean you know when do you get like to talk to standard in standard out you know set up a second payload you certainly don't on remote exploits um and so it's just you know it's the simplest way we could explore some of these ideas Obviously, we're limited by time and patience of our players, but uh, it's kind of nice to get some like top brains to think about these sorts of problems, so the rest of us can sort of uh, see how it's done. Yeah. How have you laid out your Ghidra? I'm curious, because you don't seem to be a fan, but I noticed that Neo did it the same way I do it. Like, do you have your function list on the side? I like have that. it just in the default uh, setup uh, like this. Oh, mate, uh, mate, you, you can't, you can't do this to me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so I have to deal with that uh, annoying tree view uh, for the function uh, stuff. But uh, this looks uh, much better. Yeah, definitely. It's just everything at your fingertips. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, to like sort of throw away that that famous graph view. I mean, it's there obviously if you if you need it, but it's just sort of a different user experience to not have it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I'm I'm a big uh, like proponent of the graph view when you're doing. So okay, now we're doing poning, right? And and the, the focus isn't really on the reverse engineering. So then right. the usefulness is maybe not as big. But when you're doing reverse engineering of larger things uh, I think a graph view is one of the most powerful things to just see like the general structure uh, yeah, of a yeah. program or a function yeah absolutely so much information contained there isn't it yeah yeah I mean it, it's it's actually in sometimes it's it's even better than a full decompilation because you actually see visually the structure uh, of the program like you can see the loops and the branches and stuff which yeah. is not always as clear if you have a bunch of like nested if and while statements. I think uh, it's worth noting, because I know you're never going to say this about yourself, but to people in the audience who might not be fully aware about who you are, that you are like a top level sort of reverse engineer guy. Like you, you, you go, you know what I mean? Like in, in that competitive level, you, you go there. Well, thank you. <laughs> Well, it just needed to be said. So I'll always listen to you. When it comes to Pwn, I might raise an eyebrow occasionally. <laughs> I'll listen to you 90% of the time, but occasionally I might raise an eyebrow. When it comes to reverse engineering, I'll sit down and shut up, for sure, every time. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's good that I have you here for the Pwn stuff, then. Uh, just that 10%, mate. Just yeah. the 10%. Yeah. So um, with that said, let's check in with... Mermus again. He is hunting for gadgets. He has sorted out his um, his uh, infrastructure problems. And did he? I just missed it. Did he find anything of interest? Uh, 
So what would be of interest? Let's think about this, right? Um, the reason I made it full railroads because if there's anything that's a syscall wrapper, you can just change that least significant byte and easily get to a syscall. So we didn't want that. Yeah. So the only things I can think of that would be out of the normal range of gadgets is either some special stack, you know, jiggling gadget to sort of do something where he jiggles the stack back into his buffer or potentially something that dereferences the standard out because standard out lives at a known location but has an unknown value if he could dereference that into a good register like uh, rsi or rdi or something like that he could get the leak i didn't see any gadgets like that but i didn't you know i didn't go that deep no there's always that possibility um as we know and I certainly didn't check the build ID, so <laughs> definitely might be there. <laughs> oh, that would actually be hilarious if it just by chance would be something, uh, you know, of use there. Especially if it was like a straight syscall reds or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Then uh, yeah, I guess uh, if, if if that happens, they they can have that. Uh, yeah. Now you got me paranoid. I think I'm going to check. Yeah. Uh, well, you do that. Um, so I'm, I would like to see some exploit code. I'm looking here to see if anyone, oh, speaking of graph view, uh, OTC is actually using the IDA graph view to inspect the general structure of the program. But as we said, the program is so small that, um, like the structure and functionality of the program is almost, uh, you know, completely understood from just looking at like the decompilation or um uh, just that code so i i'm uncertain if he's gonna get any extra insight here that uh he, he doesn't already have um, yeah it might just be preference yeah you know just like dragging it around like that or whatever yeah i'm just you know looking at it from different angles because that's al that's also a thing right just you know try to try out different things see if there's anything that just pops out to you but yeah i guess uh, yeah that needs to be said don't always look at the we get so lazy with these decompilers yeah, yeah, yeah. you know five years ago decompiler was still like cutting edge now everyone just goes straight there don't always look at the decompiler there's a lot of tricks there's a lot of edge cases that uh, can fool the decompiler or it just hides code from you completely yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be that, you know, it, it uh, copies some value into some register and that's not completely apparent from uh, looking at the decompilation, but looking at the disassembly, I mean, it just, you just see it immediately. Um, yep. So. Um, but in this case, it needs to be said, the decompiler is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you didn't really do anything. I mean... There, there aren't any like tricks in the code, right? It's like right. It's just there's, well, uh, you know, because it is me. Like yeah. there's one thing, but it's not really a trick. I was just sort of trying to make it easier for them. But at the end of the main function, I clear the registers, right? So any of the registers where a file points that could have been sitting, I cleared those. Now it, it seems like I did it just to be a, a dickhead, but. I really did it because we run uh, the binaries through X inet D, and uh, this this is a buffered binary, so we keep buffering on. So what that means is that buffering is handled by the kernel until, because we're using the F family of functions, eventually it gets handled by libc. And so that interaction between X inet D or Zinet D um, and libc can cause a different order of file jumps the file points at IO jumps to occur. This causes a little bit of weirdness where sometimes you run it locally, you expect that file points in the register, then you run it remotely and you don't see that same thing. So I was just trying to avoid that frustration. But aside from that, no tricks. Yeah. So essentially a, an anti-trick uh, in the code. Right. And um, yeah, still, so now we kind of reach this, uh, it, it feels that we kind of, get here in in every episode a bit of like a plateau where the participants they have that initial grasp of the challenge but there's something missing they're a bit like you know a bit stuck basically and we don't see any immediate uh progress here um 
I mean, this is this is this is the point of life, right? Or this is just exactly like life. You think everything's all good, and then you know there's a little twist. Yeah. I I I think um, I mean I don't know. Do, do, should I discuss possible ways that they might, or what the problem is, and how they might go around it, or do you want to? Just see them suffer for a little bit. Well, let's first look to see if, if Mermis has uh, any commentary going on, or um, is he he likes to uh, also uh, describe what he's doing. He's an experienced streamer as well. Parasai is going to be the format specifier, which I want to be... Yeah, so he is still like you can see he's writing a little bit on that uh, exploit, but you know I, I I don't think he even knows himself exactly where he's going at the moment. Uh, it's not not obvious to me at least. Um, switching over to uh, Neo, um, you can see him again exploring these uh, different file. Uh, library functions trying to probably still trying to get that leak right yeah definitely i mean it's a tough problem to solve really it's like it just shows you how you can take such a simple vulnerability straight buff overflow okay there's like a little skip thing at the end but that's not really anything and then just because we took out, like we kept buffering on and we only communicate through the FM functions, everything gets all complicated all of a sudden. It's just kind of interesting to see even he sort of has to like look around the binary a lot more than the, the usual case. Yeah. I wonder what he's going to go for in the end because you have an F print F which pits the 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 file points are at a different location than the f right you know what i mean one one puts it at the end one puts it at the beginning as the first argument or as the last oh yeah so it's sort of interesting within the binary you might say okay well i'll just jump to the middle of some function where it's setting up the parameters for to call f right or f print f and if you do that then remember the function didn't set up the stack canary and you still don't know what that is. So you might achieve that leak, but then you still got to trickle down through, you know, the stack check and then that's going to cause a problem. So it's a little trickier than it sounds. Yeah, so we could... Uh... Um, maybe speak a little bit about because we we hinted at that it might be uh, you know different uh, there could be different solutions uh, to this right and mm -hmm. yeah so w w what could we imagine so let's first just uh, talk about like the the intended solution again uh, quickly so they are um, they're supposed to use this um, this all right to get the 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 rop uh, going to st start some kind of leak right um, to create this you need to find the locations of these um, the structure or the standard out right right so the first yeah exactly the first part of the rop chain is all about like figuring mm -hmm. out something right get a leak going somehow so the intended method is that you would obviously it's always easy to control the base pointer, always, right? You get it before you even get the return address. So by controlling the base pointer, that's really powerful. A lot of people sort of skip over that one, but it is really powerful. Not only is there a leave ret, so obviously you could pivot the application, but you can also restart the application. And now all of those writes to local variables, including the stack canary, including this buffer, all of that stuff, that file pointer, that will be in reference relative to the base pointer. So you can still have that metadata that controls the program flow sitting on the real stack, but you can pit all of that other stuff into the data section. 
which means that it's at known memory locations because there's no pi. So that kind of makes it a little bit easier to set something up where you could write your rock chain around those values that already exist. So you restart the binary, it's going to write those local variables to the data section but still keep the control flow on the stack and then you will restart it again and then pit your rock chain around those values and now you never needed to leak uh, the standard out to get that first leak. That's one way to do it. Yep. Another way to do it is to have, you have three libc points sitting on the data section. Uh, the standard out, standard in, and standard error. So if you can, you can overwrite those using something similar to what I mentioned before, partially, and then uh, you can dereference that for a write. Uh, that's kind of trickier here because that's really close to the top. And remember, when you when you pivot a stack, the stack goes from top to bottom, from high memory address to low memory address. So being in a low memory address on data dot data uh, is not going to give you a lot of room to call things before you crash into read-only memory. So that's like a bit tricky. I really didn't want to have to discuss that one because I don't want to confuse people. And then the, the last option is um, there's all sorts of magic with uh, IO file jumps in the file pointers that you can do. A lot of them have been fixed in recent libc's and you're running libc uh, 2.7, uh, 2.27 yep. with the uh, Ubuntu 18.04.1. Uh, so it, it's it's pretty much fixed, but you can still do various things. So then you'll basically be treating it like a modern version of a file pointer overwrite, which isn't the same as what it used to be. I'll give you that. It's a bit tricky, uh, but that exists. There are some options there. Some of them are very esoteric, uh, but they're out there. You know, I've seen blogs, especially the Chinese blogs. If you guys don't, you should read Chinese blogs. I don't know what's going on over there, but they have some really good info. So just uh, learn Chinese, read the Chinese blogs, and you're good. Absolutely. Yeah. If you could pull that off, you're going to be a great poem guy. Yeah. And then there's Google Translate if, if the first Yeah, if you want to be a pleb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, let's... Uh, can check in so here. I call it a partial pivot. I just want to put that out there. Yep. Right? I'm naming it a partial pivot to a partial, full pivot. Partial stack pivot. Right, because it sounds cool. Yeah. No, but that we're going with that. We are we are coining terms here. Like uh, yeah, Pwnsmith, That was yours today. Right? Yeah. And uh, our uh, participating uh, pornographers. So. Right. And we we're all sitting around watching some pornography. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, speaking of sitting around, uh, we, for those who uh, haven't noticed yet, we did set up uh, an IRC channel uh, on Freenode, so it's uh, a channel uh, pony racing. Uh, I mean, where where you can hang out and discuss the episodes or uh, poning in general. Uh, we are still trying to get it, you know, off the ground a little bit, but. Uh, you're very welcome to join if you have uh, suggestions about the episodes or improvements um, you're, or just want to talk about uh, binary exploitation uh, in general. Or if you want to play. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, if you're interested in, in participating in one of these episodes, uh, you should definitely get in contact. And one way of doing that is uh, join the IRC and, and talk to us there. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, so that's uh, pony racing uh, on free node uh, good to know I really hate when when it's like they're not moving the mouse around that much yeah it's uh, just I, f I feel that like the oh, agony shit, what? Yeah. yeah exactly yeah it's really it's like all, all four of them it's I mean, it's tricky. It's simple, but it's tricky. It's like everything in this game is yeah. like, it's so simple once you know the answer. Yeah. It, it's just, but before that, you have to grind a little bit. You got burned. But I will say this. These guys are all persistent. So I, I, I'm not going to feel sorry for them. They'll get it done. Yeah. Oh, there was a question here. How does the flag submitter work? Uh, yeah, so... Uh... 
unlike regular uh, regular uh, pwnable challenges where you're just supposed to get the flag file on the remote server uh, we have a binary uh, and this is a cool trick if you want to use for for infrastructure stuff is that uh, in in uh, Linux or I guess like all Unix systems uh, you can make uh, you can make a binary uh, executable but not readable so um, you can store uh, like tokens or stuff inside the binary uh, for it so basically what it does is it takes an argument for the uh, of the name of the person solving the challenge and it talks to our uh, API which is um, connected to the graphics server on this stream uh, and that it will like, trigger the victory for the person running this uh, program with the, um, their own uh, nickname as a argument so that's a good little uh, trick for your CDF setups if you need uh, we also use that for example in the Midnight Sun uh, qualifiers we had this challenge uh, Rubens Cube where you were supposed it was trivial to get uh like uh, f lo uh, local file inclusion but the goal was to get code execution so we didn't we couldn't store just a flag.txt file so instead we have the binary which uh if you ran it just uh printed out the flag um, um if you get an executable that's just it has the execute bit set but not the read bit you could still read it through ptrace though right Unless you limit that as well, right? Oh, I guess, but then you have to allow. I mean, then you have to do the ptrace to start with. Or... Right. Yeah. 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 You'd have to like, yeah, either attach or start it with the ptrace thing. But it's just you know, yep. I I just break things in my mind. I, I don't know. There's <laughs> something wrong with me. Yeah. But I mean, it's uh, in the in the in our particular case here. It's not a. It's not really a. It's not a security feature. It's a convenience uh, feature for them to just yeah. run the binary and and uh, to score the victory instead of yeah, having absolutely. somewhere to submit the flag. Um, yeah, I like it, and I also like that you force them to get you know a shell as well. I don't yeah. want. Uh, I don't want them to just get reads. Who respects a read? No, we we want the full RC. That's it, man. That's all we. That's you know they they're supposed to be world class, so <laughs> let's make them go all the way. Yeah. Uh the the lack of movement is really bumming me out. Yeah. yeah. So we can talk about another thing uh, while we hope that they kind of you know find that that key to the next step, and that is so. Uh, now it's the end of June. We're doing the fifth episode of Pony Racing. We're trying to do this once a month. Uh, that means we will do one episode at the end of July. And then the seventh episode will be at the end of August, which is also when uh, CCC Camp is happening. So I had this crazy idea of uh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a Pony Racing episode seven on site at CCC Camp? With the like live participants and live uh, audience. Sounds what? Sorry. So so yeah, Bob. No, I was just I was just doing the like what? No, oh yeah 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 no it's so that that sounds cool right? Uh, but yeah, for yeah. that we need uh, it's it's a bit of a logistical uh, challenge since uh, I will be uh, flying to Germany and not like taking a car or something. Uh, we will probably need some help from people who are a bit more local to maybe you know some uh, help with like i don't know chairs and tables and maybe like a screen or projector or something uh, some cabling uh to, to make this work players. oh yeah and uh then we also need uh poners who are going to ccc camp and unfortunately since uh my dear bob here is not going uh, we're also going to need to sort out uh, another uh, co-commentator for it. Uh, well, you did have some good people in line, so I'm pretty sure it's going to be like a nice special episode. Yeah. No, I, I, I think it should be really easy to find top-level poners that are going to CCC camp. Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels like that, right? It's like, you know, either they're underground or they're at that CCC camp. Yeah. That's the, that's the only options. So basically, if you are going to CCC camp uh, and you either can help out with logistics around this or you are interested in participating, 
uh, please reach out to me uh, as soon as possible so that we can try to make this uh, happen. And that's uh, yeah, we, we we will we will remind you of this uh, later as well and get back to this. Uh, but it would be really cool to be able to do uh, live on-site pony racing at CCC camp. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. Yep. Um, so there's a question yep. from Int80. It says, is it possible to solve the challenge with the bespoke gadget with the one gadget tool? So that's that's an interesting approach. I don't... I mean, you could if you wanted to like brute force th on three levels at once, which since it's 64 bit, that's not ideal. So obviously you don't know where Libc is, so you have to brute force that, and it's not 12 bits of entropy like it is on uh, x86, uh, 32 bit. So then you have that problem, and then also don't forget I clear those registers right before the end, so that leaves you with one. Uh, one-shot gadget um, so a lot of them will rely on the fact that there's a, uh, a file pointer already sitting in one of those registers you, you have to wipe all of those ones off the table but there are some others that just look for a value on the stack to be null so maybe you could use that but it would just be a lot of brute forcing and that's not really what I expect from these guys no so let's check in with uh, kid of, of Ukraine here because he has a lot of uh, exploit code uh, going on here so uh, for example this function uh, call uh, CSU uh, which is universal gadgets I reckon he, yeah what he's doing is he's trying to populate usually you don't get a pop RDX gadget anywhere in the the binary right normal GCC sort of stuff yeah. you're not gonna find that and you're not gonna find RCX either but you can use uh, CSU in it, which is like a function that's always in these binaries, and you can basically you, you you pop a bunch of registers, then you return back to the top of the CSU in it or somewhere in the middle, and then the values of those registers end up in uh, RSI, RDI, and RDX, and then you have to sort of pass through this little area where it calls a function pointer, it dereferences uh, a pointer, and then calls that. And so people just usually point that to the finny function, which does nothing, usually. And then um, you can control RDX. So what that might be, the only reason I could think of that he might be using that is for uh, f writes. Yeah, and now he even removed that part. I don't see that function anymore in his script. So while you were explaining that, he... Uh, I kind of looked away right. for a second, so... Well, he gave me a good excuse to mention that because I know a lot of these people uh, haven't figured that one out yet. But yeah, I mean, I don't really. Although you can use, he might. There might be a path. I don't know this. I haven't tried this, but there might be a path to dereference a pointer through that chain of gadgets, which may get you something like standard out file pointer in some register. I don't know. That sounds tricky though. Yeah. So let's look at the gadgets he has, um, you know, listed here on the top of of his uh, script. I mean, first of all, he has something that he is named Haha. Uh, do you recognize that address from the top of your head, uh, Bob? The six o three. Is that? That any? would be just out of the data section. So obviously, it maps one page, four thousand ninety six bytes, yep. and that is from six o two o o o. Yeah. And so that would be the absolute top. So that's out of that range. So that's not writable memory. That address doesn't actually, I don't think it's mapped. Okay. But then, just under that, one byte under that is mapped. Yeah. And then he has the uh, main function and then some gadgets for... Is he's overwriting RBP, the saved base pointer, absolute top of the data section. And so that's clever because, like I said, you remember the stack goes from high memory to low memory. So he he's basically setting up exactly what we said, the partial pivot idea. Yeah. I think we had a very slight issue with the stream here. I think it will come back into fine quality any moment. I don't know. There was some kind of hiccup here. Uh, hopefully it, it, the text will return to a readable 
uh, state uh, very soon. I apologize for that. Uh, so we will have to try to, to, to guide you through what's uh, happening. Uh, if we check in with um, Mermus again, he is again um, looking for gadgets. Uh, not <coughs> sure what he's going to find. And also a bit worried about this image quality here. Um, Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder. So it doesn't really look like he's found anything that he, you know, really fancies yet. Right, that's exactly, I think, yeah, I think you're onto it. Like, he's not looking for something specific. He's just sort of fishing around and seeing what takes him. Yeah. You know, maybe it's a dereference gadget. Maybe he finds that magical stack jiggling gadget or something like that, um, which I can't rule out. That isn't the method that we went with here, uh, but I can't rule it out for sure. I didn't go that direction. Yep. And obviously, if anyone's going to find some weird method, I think he's definitely one of those guys. And uh, yeah, so let's ch see what Neo is up to. Also writing some exploit. Oh, he's written a comment here, round two. So there we go. Round two RSP fixed. So that's kind of the idea, right? Yeah. And let's let's just look at the start of his exploit there. He sends, it reads until the file. He sends that long thing, sends the... 18 uh, hex 18 thing and then his rob chain and the rob chain is uh, pop uh, rdi cave top which i would then guess would be uh where he's gonna put uh let's see what there is that's the 602 so that's in the data section then right yeah and then yeah so it looks like he is going in the right direction then uh -huh. and he's popping RSI uh, and then putting that sprintf function in there. Yeah, so that's that's really interesting. Uh, and now in the second uh, round, so he finishes off his uh, yeah. So he 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 pops the. Um, Pops the RSP there to the cave top minus twenty four. That's what's uh, what happens at the end of his first uh, rob chain. Right. Okay. So if he gets a file name that's valid, then there's a sprintf function that uh, makes a human readable size. So he's using that cleverly in order to do all of the exact same things, which is very cool. Yep. And then he's going back to main, obviously. Yep. And now he's just testing this out to see where it takes him. Uh, and I don't think that was what he was intending, right? Just exited without anything happening. So let's try to see what he's oh, doing. All right. So uh, I should probably put this out there. Because the, bu the binary is buffered, you yep. have to flush unless there is something, uh, you know, like a new line or something at the end, yep. the white space that will flush the buffer. You have to flush it. Now, there is an F flush function in there. Yep. So you would need to call that. Yep. If you run main again, it gets called for you. Yeah, so that's interesting. But it does seem that he is, like, now on to, like, the right track. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, so he, he's adjusting. Let's. I'm trying to see here what his second stage uh, uh, chain is doing. He's just popping a like a canary value into RDI to just I guess just check that it works. Uh, and then he has uh, the standard out in RSI. Where does he get that from? That's just the the pointer to that file structure, right? The uh, that's on the BSS or. 
I yeah, it might think. be. Yeah. It might be the one that's already up there, like really close to the top. Oh. I'd have to see the address again. Yeah. Okay, but uh, so let's let's uh, temporarily check in with the others then while he's sorting out some some uh, issues there. Um, so Mermus reading some man pages. It was printed. Let's see yeah. what he has to say. Uh, he was talking here. Hmm. He's reading the uh, man pages for like the printf family of functions and memset as well. Always good oh. to read the documentation. Interesting. Absolutely. Memset will return a pointer to S. So I can mem set it anything zero. So I'll set racks to be what I want. Now that racks points at that, I can use this increment pointer to point it to something useful. Okay, this is getting janky, but I think I can do it. Okay, so he has some interesting uh, ideas there. We'll see if if that helps him. Um, if we go look at the uh, kid of uh, Ukraine again, um, he's also using memsets for something here. So looks like both of them uh, are considering this. So why why would they be calling memset, Bob? Uh, that's a great question. So, hmm, it's either to get a residual register, right? So, you know, when you call syscalls or whatever, there's going to be some volatile register that's populated. Yep. Or, or it's a setup. But looking at those arguments, I don't think it's a setup. So, I'm curious myself. So can it be that so so Mermis was talking about this the return value of memset is the is the string argument. So that would set the RAX register to to one of the so it's it's basically would be like a like a move from uh what is it RDI to RAX? Oh uh, right, right. Yes, you're right. Okay. <clears throat> so they are using it to set up a register. Uh, yeah, that's clever. I like that. So just a, it's a zero length mem set to copy. Yep. The... Yep. Yep. That's that's a good one. I like that. It's sort of like that thing that you do whenever you ha you don't know where in memory you are, and then you just call a fake syscall. Because it's going to fail, but you, it's always going to, you know, anytime you enter that sort of context switch with the syscall, you're yep. going to populate RCX with uh, the current instruction pointer. Yep. So it's a bit like that. Yeah. Is this something they could use? Uh, um, you were talking about this, like the CSU thing where they have to survive a call or something. What do you mean? Like, uh, could they use this with that? Yeah. Or... I mean, yeah, they could. I don't think it's going to be useful, though. There's a, that CSU in it is really great for getting things from the stack into those specific registers. Uh, but then those registers get cleared after, so I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I can't rule anything out. These goddamn hackers. Yeah, <laughs> goddamn hackers, indeed. Uh, let's check back with Neo because he has written some more on his uh, exploit here. Uh, I love when they do that. Yeah, so he's doing his round two ROP chain. So now he's he doesn't have a dummy value in that uh, RDI register anymore. He has uh, some address there on the data. Right, so what he probably did was he ran it to see what gets written in that data section with yeah. that... Uh, pivot yeah. that we spoke about earlier and then he just wants to sort of quickly see where it is yeah got the address stuck it into that value so yeah he's he's onto the the exact part i mean you can see him 
yeah. he's got an exploit, right? It's oh, now he, now he's checking the offset for system. Right, exactly. He's he's there. So why did he need the free call then? Why is he stuffed the free point or free uh, the free uh, function in there? It's a good question. You see, I need like to see the exploit. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Like he pops free into. Oh, it's it might be because it's the first thing in the global offset table. Oh, maybe. Um, because I mean, we're not doing anything heap uh, at all. Yeah, there are some heap operations here, but not because we call malloc directly, but uh, we call some functions that call malloc, and it's just uh, good. Oh, so I might free. have screwed up a little bit. Neo just messaged me and said that he, he managed to pop shell uh, locally, but I might have, the the server might have been, uh, give me a second. Uh, so. Oh boy, PPP does it again. Yeah, let's see if he gets it. So, um, let's let's see. This this is really exciting now. Is he getting it? Um. Want to see his his screen when this happens? Oh, there's a huge delay on his stream. That's why we didn't see it. So, Bob, are you still with me? I'm with you. Yeah. I'm uh, on the edge of my chair. Yeah, I am as well. I want to see. I want to see when it pops. This is gonna work. Drum roll. Uh, the excitement here. So uh, basically, I had forgot to start the uh, the remote uh, server. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. He's got the. But that doesn't look like a great leak, though. So. Yeah, that that Libsy leak is not in the right range. It the, the the lower bytes are, the lower four bytes, but not the top. Yeah, I did run into this uh, while I was making the exploit, actually. Okay, so you know he's he's almost there, but yeah, some some wiggling left to do with the specifics. Whoa! Now congratulations, he got it. Boom. Boom. Let's get him in here. Let's um, first enjoy those fireworks for a few seconds. Let's User get Neo in here. Hello, Neo. Channel. Congratulations. Oh, hey, yo. <laughs> well done. Well done. Let's turn off those fireworks and put it up on this and put this up on the split screen again. And uh, yeah, so maybe um, you could. Uh, so first of all, what did you think of the challenge? How did you like it? Well, that that was weirdly frustrating. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, so you know, obviously, I have to, I have the bug very very early. I know how to bypass Canary, all that stuff, and then it's like, oh crap! I can't write anything to standard out because I don't have a handle to standard out. Holy God! This then then it's basically like an hour of finding standard out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was basically the the, the challenge. Yeah, uh, in, interesting challenge, that's for sure. That's cool. Would you mind uh, doing a, a bit of like a, a run through of your? Uh, of your exploit of your uh, yeah your chain and so on yeah absolutely so uh, early on I realized um, that the the byte by byte read was intended to let you basically you know because I, I looked at the stack um, uh, structure and I realized that obviously the buffer is sitting right before the the, the index into the buffer yeah. that means that we can write into the index and then jump over the canary and write to the ROP directly so that's useful um, but then uh, basically the challenge is structured such that uh, at no point do you really get a very easily accessible handle to standard out. And th there are no functions like printf that directly print to standard out. So even though I have a, a pop RDI, pop RSI, I have control of the first two arguments. Um, 
which means I can call any two argument function, but I don't have access to uh, actually print anything to me, so I can leak anything. And of course, um, uh, libc is, is randomized. So I spent a little while thinking about it, and then I realized that um, I also don't have control over any writable memory in the program either, because I only have access to one byte, uh, which is the character that's being read, and one integer, which is the index of the, of the character I'm writing. And that's not enough to do anything useful. But what I did realize is we do have a stack pivot, a very convenient stack pivot, uh, as, or power SP with a bunch of stuff. And this particular stack pivot, um, I, I can control to some, I can control because this, the, bro the program is not PIE. I thought about, after a little while, I came up with a bit of a bonsai strategy, which is to stack pivot into BSS. Um, and now if, in, if I want to stack pivot into BSS, I need to have a return address to, uh, to go to. Uh, and so I figured, why don't I just call entry? And where do I get entry? A pointer to, so I, I can copy a pointer to entry using sprintf. So this, what this first bit is doing here is I've got um, sprintf here, uh, and I can actually use sprintf as a mem copy, basically, as, as long as it doesn't contain anything terribly interesting, right? So I put the first argument, the destination, uh, and, then the, uh, and then the second argument is whatever I want to copy from. And then what I did is uh, I found a pointer to entry, which is, of course, sitting in the elf header. So if you look at the elf header up here, then we've got a pointer to entry right there. And then uh, I can actually mem copy that basically into our little ROP chain. Oh, uh, basically wow. mem copy it into our fake, into our fake stack. Beautiful. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm basically copying, mem copying a pointer to entry into my fake stack. And luckily, that actually all works. Uh, nothing breaks when I do that. And suddenly, um, I'm executing from a stack that's in a known address inside BSS. And so uh, that's what I call round one here is the stack pivot. And so once I have access to BSS, then everything becomes a lot easier because all the addresses to the whole stack is known. And um, I can control that arbitrarily. So in, in round two, what I basically do is I, uh, I sprint F again to copy a pointer to, from standard out. So standard out is a pointer sitting in BSS as well. So I can copy a pointer from that into somewhere on the stack. Namely, I will copy it into the middle of the ROP chain I'm building. So I will pop, uh, copy basically a pointer to standard out into the middle of the ROP chain and then pop that immediately afterwards. So see this 414141 here gets replaced as a, uh, as a placeholder for what, where standard out will end up. And then I can F printf with a pointer to real standard out. So that works luckily, and I get a leak to, to libc. And then, of course, it's easy, because I can just return to main one more time and do system bin sh. And that's the end of the ROP chain. There was one subtlety, which is that on my system, I didn't redirect standard error. But on the remote system, it redirects standard error to standard out. Uh, and so um, I had to, uh, I, I was getting bad data back because I was not reading correctly. But that's a minor um, uh, glitch. Otherwise, yeah, that's basically how that works. Uh, three rounds where we, we do stack pivot, uh, then we grab a handle to standard out, leak some leak libc, and then we win. Perfect. That's really nice. Yeah, lovely. It's it's almost like the, the normal method that I did, except that sprint f bit, but it's the same sort of thing, like restarting three times. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, I, I, I imagine that you could probably use a couple of other functions for the copy, but uh, I, I had I had sort of fixated on sprintf pretty early in the run, and so that's what I ended up using. <laughs> so basically, yeah, uh, it worked. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I love that. That's cool. So, um, Bob, do you want to ask your, uh, your standard question as well about the... All right. Uh, so if you were to rate this challenge in terms of difficulty on the normal CTF scale between 100 and 500, what would you say? Uh, I mean, the, the, the fact that you kind of need to find a stack pivot, so the, the bug is really easy, um, so that definitely lowers the score somewhat. Um, the stack pivot bit is cute and obviously pretty pretty cooked, because uh, in a normal program, somebody would call printf somewhere. Um, but, uh, but, so it, 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 but it's a really cute problem, actually, and I really appreciate the, the, the sort of interesting of it. I probably would rate it, I don't know, like... Um, uh, this is a flat CTF scale, so it might be a little bit different, but probably about a 200, 250, maybe oh, wow. like that range. Yeah. Okay. Maybe about a 200, yeah. Yeah, okay. So. It's not too bad. We usually shoot for 150, so yeah. I was kind of in the right area. 
I was expecting it to be a, I, I, think, I think maybe I was thinking it was a bit, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's time consuming because I think the main thing that you need to do is find that sort of thread the needle through the, through the stack pivot kind of thing. Um, that's the part that makes it uh, a bit more challenging. Otherwise, yeah, um, for Plaid, I'd probably put it at about 200. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're pretty loosey-goosey with Plaid uh, scoring. Though, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also, I mean, Bob, you, you didn't really, you didn't go on the easier end of the scale this time since, uh, like, uh, you've been hyping uh, that Neo was participating as well, so. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you know, you got world-class people, so I don't really think that a 200 would be a, much of a problem, so I thought, why not? Yeah, that's cool. So I think we've, we've been going on here now for um, like considering after the delays and stuff. So roughly like 115, 120 something. So I think uh, it's a, maybe a good time to start uh, wrapping this up. So we should probably uh, bring in the other uh, participants in here to have a little bit of a uh, chat as well. Uh, and yeah, let's do that. So, and again, congratulations, Neo. User, so. was User, was congratulations. User was moved to your channel. User was moved to your channel. User was moved to your channel. Hello, guys. Thanks. Hello. Uh, so, uh, Neo uh, solved the challenge and won. Um, and I'm, I'm actually just watching the stream now, just uh, just to see what's going on. <laughs> So yeah, um, big, huge uh, congratulations to him and well, uh, well played everyone else. Uh, good job uh, on the challenge. How did you how did you find it? So it's Murmurs. How, how was your progress? I'd like to think that it's decent, but I also feel like I'm very much missing something. Oh, the 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 constant feeling of pawn, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So, how was it going for you, uh, OTC? Uh, horrible. Okay. I was drawing blanks all the time. I had no idea what to do. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, that's tough. It's cool. Or uh was how was it going for you? Um, I think I have an idea of how to do it, but I think I've hit a few dead ends along the way. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I I definitely feel like there's an easier solution to the one that I was about to start working on. Yeah. Now you mind the uh, just giving a, you know, the short explanation of what you were trying to do. Well, so the next thing that I'm going to try and do is copy the so because I can't modify the value in the got, I'm going to have to copy the value for the libc address for real path to someplace I can write to so I can change the bottom byte to it and then call that which I think I can do and be able to call system with whatever I want. But that sounds way more complicated than it needed to be. Uh, the solution I came up with is pretty freaking complicated. So <laughs> <I guess. laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's cool. So uh, any other comments? How did, how did you like the challenge? The Mermus, OTC, Arcania? Uh, assuming I didn't miss something and that the bug is actually just there's like, if the challenge is that there's a stack buffer overflow you're able to jump over the cookie and then you're trying to do ROP with a very small number of ROP gadgets I like it uh, if I miss something huge I'm not sure I like it <laughs> <laughs> no but I mean it's it's just that basically I mean just with the biggest quotation marks imaginable <laughs> around it yeah in that case it's uh, pretty good I like it cool uh, yeah, so uh, that, sorry, that was Neo. amusingly enough. I think the first time I actually used Gidra seriously <laughs> because <laughs> I usually use Ida. Yeah, but I'm like, I don't really want to set up Ida right now, so it was kind of fun. Yeah, but that was cool. We had two people using uh, Gidra, two people using Ida, so it's nice, nice to have a, a little bit of a uh, mix. Uh, the, good for the viewers as well to see the different, the different tools. We talk a lot, of, a lot about the different tools that you use for for various. Things like the different debuggers, different uh, reverse engineering tools, different uh, ROP gadget finders, and yeah, and so on. Um, yeah, any other comments or remarks on this episode today? Yeah, no. well, that was a, that was pretty fun actually. Um, I, uh, I I definitely enjoyed the uh, the experience for sure. Um, I I think.
you think? Oh, well, sorry, I, I, I got distracted by the fact that my voice started echoing because I was watching the stream. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, I, I should uh, try to see what my heart rate was um, because I'm pretty sure right after, the, um, right after I found the stack pivot, yeah. Uh, my heart rate was was spiking because I could feel it. I was like, I have, I, I, I can do this. I can, I can go now. And so then it was just like, yeah. And then, and then writing the last little bit, the, 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 the stack pivot. I was really just like, oh god, I really hope nobody's got here yet. <laughs> kind of feeling. Oh yeah, it can be probably a bit stressful, like doing it in the blind, like no idea where the others are. Uh, that's part of the race. Yeah, it was the same for us watching. As soon as we saw you like uh, writing just the word system, we were like, oh, shit, it's about to happen. Yeah. And then I managed to mess up that I didn't have the service running on the remote server. That was a bit of a, uh, a bummer. Uh, I, I should have flagged you at the beginning because I, I, I ran connect.sh and it didn't work. Oh. I should have flagged you at the beginning, but I sent, kind of assumed that you were going to bring it up at some point. Yep. Um, uh, it's a good assumption, though. So <laughs> I, I should have. Uh, yeah, but that was fine. That was fine. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so, again, uh, yeah, we should probably remind people again of... So, first of all, uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, participating. Um, Mermus was the second time. So, the first the first time we have a person returning for another episode. So, that was really cool. Nice that you uh, came back. Nice to have you here. And also, of course, uh, big thanks to everyone else uh, participating. Um, so, it was a really good... Uh, episode i think it's really entertaining to see you uh work on this um so for all the viewers thanks so much for putting this on oh yeah no, yeah thanks uh no problem um so for for the viewers if you are if you find that lo this looks uh really interesting and you want to try it out uh, yourself uh as usual we will be releasing the community challenge uh tomorrow so uh, the way this works is that uh, tomorrow at the same time as the episode started, so it's uh, 4 p.m. C uh, UTC, we will be releasing a challenge on the website, which is pony.racing. And that's a ponable um, challenge, like this one. And the first one to solve it gets invited to the next episode uh, of pony racing which will happen in uh, about a month uh, or so yeah, so that's a good uh, good opportunity if you want to um you know prove yourself and get invited to the next uh, episode so that will be released tomorrow uh 4 p.m utc on the website pony.racing uh, and again as i said we're trying to um do this the goal is to be able to do this live on site at ccc camp not for the next episode which is uh, will be at the end of july but the episode after that which will be at the end of august we want to do it uh, a live on site ccc camp edition of pony racing but for that we will need some uh, help with the logistics and help with uh, we need participants who are on site at ccc camp uh, so if you know if you want to participate if you are at CCC camp and want to participate or if you can help out with some logistics like I don't know tables chairs uh, projector cabling uh, please reach out to us um, at either like DM me on Twitter or email on contact at pony dot racing or in the IRC channel that we mentioned uh, pony racing at, uh, on the free node uh, server um, yeah and I think that's it bob do you have any uh closing remarks for today uh not really except to just you know thank everyone for participating it was really cool Mermis, you're a badass obviously uh i love having ppp here and dcua that's always good and otzi you're representing sweden mate so well done <laughs> uh and i hope to see one of your teammates back real soon yep that's cool. So yeah, thanks everyone for uh, today and I hope you tune in uh, on the next episode which will be ab in about uh, a month and I will be announcing it uh, here on YouTube uh, so you can like, if you subscribe and turn on notification, you should get a notification there uh, and also we'll be posting it on uh, Twitter uh, and you know, spamming it in all kinds of different channels. So don't miss that and uh, don't forget the community challenge uh, tomorrow to uh, for a chance to participate in the next episode um so yeah goodbye and have a nice uh
continued Saturday. Bye.